So I appreciate all of you braving the heat and coming out here um, for some pretty incredible uh, speakers that we have lined up. If you are here last month, you heard a little bit about longevity care, which is senior care, but it's longevity care now. In particular from AIU Longevity, Jim, the chairman, was talking about how he's leveraging or plans to leverage CBD, particularly for uh, folks in longevity care with dementia. Very exciting stuff. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, we post all of the videos on canagather.com, um, particularly at this link right there. Everything is free. So if you're interested in learning more about that or any of the other crazy things that happened at Canagather last month, be sure to check it out. Um, so Canagather uh, is not just me hanging out on a chair, um, although I do do that once a month. Um, it is a huge team effort. So I want to give a big round of applause for everyone. You've probably met many of them already, um, but another round of applause for everyone uh, on the screen who puts this lovely event together. Thank you so much for making this happen. Um, and so before we get started, a couple notes. Um, the after party is across the street at Adoro Lay. We have free pizzas and discounted drinks. Um, uh, we do not have name tags, so I strike, strike through that. And um, we're going to have a cool event uh, next month. I mean, hopefully, if we find a venue. Um, but no, uh, Yvette says that she's going to work on having us be back here. Um, but if we're not back here, I'll let you know. Um, I'm very concerned about where the venue is going to be, but I'm going to pretend that I'm not. So get your tickets to next month. We'll figure it out. Um, as I said, we've been doing this for five and a half years. We'll, we'll figure out where we'll host it, um, even if it's not here. So we have Dr. Eric Hollander, going to be an amazing event. Be sure to grab your tickets. Virio. Who from Virio would like to do the honors? Dr. Paloma. Good evening, Canagather. <laughs> I already get applause before I start talking. I love it. My name is Dr. Paloma Leifelt with Virio Health. We're a physician-led 10-state medical and Puerto Rico medical cannabis company, bringing the best innovation, engineering, technology, and education to medical cannabis. Want to announce that today we started doing same-day free delivery, all five of the boroughs in New York City and all the way out to Long Island, Suffolk County. So that's awesome. Um, really happy to be sponsoring today specifically. It's a really important topic and really looking forward to the keynote. Um, at Virio, we feel that the best way to end the stigma is through education, which is why we paired with major research institutions throughout the country. Most notably, we have a study running out one of our dispensaries, a $3.8 million NIH grant focusing on uh, opioid reduction in chronic pain patients. And we're super excited about that. So if anyone has any questions, want some swag, feel free to come by our table. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Canada Gather. Looking forward to tonight. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody, I'm Liz Wald, and I'm here to talk about um, an event that Canopy Boulder, who is, yes, based in Boulder, Colorado, is putting on here in New York City. We're going to have an accelerator weekend here in New York City for entrepreneurs, for industry professionals, for investors. Canopy Boulder, if you guys aren't familiar with them, was started about five years ago as a venture fund and incubator for companies in cannabis and CBD pre-revenue up through, you know, thriving companies. And they are excited about what's coming in the future in New York. So we're putting a toe in the water here in New York City the last weekend in September. Grab a flyer from me and or see me after this event uh, across the street. And um, we love entrepreneurs. We love mentors. We really need to get the a broad community of people, and we're excited about to hear about what Jumani's talking about and share it with all your networks. So thanks so much, and come see me. Cool. Thank you so much. Next, uh, some news. So some of you may have heard um, the MRTA did not pass. Um, if you didn't know that, um, the MRTA did not pass. Um, decriminalization did. Uh, we'll definitely talk about that. Um, in a little bit. Um, we can chat more about that. Um, long conversation. Um, for some of you that, that probably didn't see the news, uh, the House um, had a subcommittee uh, hearing on descheduling. Um, very, very exciting topic. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, just 
moving from schedule one to schedule two, or schedule five. Um, we're talking about like this whole cannabis prohibition thing is backwards. Like, the whole thing doesn't make sense. It's racist. Like it just doesn't make sense. Um, and I thought it was pretty good. Um, it was very exciting. The whole video is online. Um, some really expert testimony. Um, folks like uh, Dr. David Nathan um, and, and several others um, who will hopefully be future uh, Canada Gather speakers in addition to that past um, speaker uh, were just absolutely incredible. The Baltimore uh, DA, one of the leading experts in DC, um, just dropping knowledge left and right. Uh, I learned a ton um, and also learned um, some from uh, um, from some of the, the representatives uh, on the Hill. Um, Congressman uh, Nadler, for example, mentioned the, the history of cannabis in Asia, um, which as an East Asian studies major, I feel like I should have known, but I didn't. So there's tons to learn. Um, the video is online, uh, and most importantly, it's a historic moment uh, for the movement. Um, so definitely uh, learn more about that. Um, and what could be more historic than uh, a house committee discussion, well, obviously Jay-Z. Jay-Z is now getting formally into the legal cannabis industry uh, with a brand partnership, getting involved uh, with the company on the West Coast, um, but you know, potentially in the East Coast if we can change that. Um, with Kaliva, um, you know, very active with a lot of the, the influencers, uh, the brand celebrity influencers. Um, very exciting news, uh, obviously a cultural icon um, and a billionaire. Um, very cool to have more people in the industry. So um, last but not least, I want to give a quick shout out to uh, some of our remaining sponsors. Um, uh, BDS Analytics is the leading uh, data provider for the industry. Um, so if you're looking to really get a sense of what's being sold in the markets, particularly uh, in the legal markets that is, particularly on the West Coast, uh, BDS has all that information. They have various reports. Uh, happy to uh, connect you with some of that, uh, some free, uh, some discounted. Uh, Splash is uh, our event service provider. Um, that's where you bought the tickets from. Uh, Trust Capital. Um, we have some of those folks uh, here uh, today. Um, so if you're looking for funding for your company or just support uh, from an incubation standpoint, um, Trust Capital. Uh, be sure to speak with uh, with them. And last but not least, uh, Herba Verde Group. Uh, thank you for your support. Uh, North Carolina-based uh, hemp operation, large scale. Um, and um, yeah, so. Uh, as you may know, we have a couple other events in other places, as I mentioned when I was killing time. Um, our next event, Dr. Eric Hollander, grab your stuff. Um, and then now is a good time. We have, we have two amazing speakers. Um, we have um, uh, Jumani just entered the building. Round of applause. Thank you, Jumani, for coming out. Thank you. Um, Take out your phone. You know, usually the polite thing to do is to like put away your phone and like really focus. Um, but in this case, you know, take out your phone, tweet if, if people, you know, are still using Twitter versus Instagram or Facebook, whatever your social media of choice is, or actually just use all of them. Um, post, pictures, all that stuff. Um, and I want to introduce, I know Koss wasn't able to be here. Um, he was pitching for half a million dollars uh, in Boston and still maybe. Um, and at first I was upset that he wasn't able to make it, but then I was like half a million dollars is a lot of money. So uh, Koss, I, I wish you well and, and hope that you uh, secure, secure the bag. Um, but very excited to have Floyd uh, Jarvis speak. So Floyd is also uh, on the Start Smart Coalition, which has been working uh, for the MRTA. Um, and the rest of his bio, uh, I will uh, let him introduce himself. Um, so Floyd, thank you so much for, for coming and joining us tonight and sharing your story. So Floyd, oh wow, this is loud. How you doing, everyone? Take it away. Uh, like the Bible says, um, face looks familiar. Now that I'm looking at it intently. Um, Floyd Jarvis, I am a Bar Prison Initiative Public Health Fellow. Uh, Bar Prison Initiative. Anybody familiar with Bar? Anyone familiar with Bar? Yes. Okay. So uh, the Bar Prison Initiative Public Health Fellow is seeks to have directly impacted persons, uh, it seeks to have directly impacted persons uh, be at the forefront of public health conversations, uh, specifically in New York State and New York City. 
um, Bar Prison Bar Prison Initiative came about after uh, Pell Grants were cut from uh, prison. So nonprofits and community-based organizations had to go in, similar to BARD, similar to, I'm not a BARD alum, I am a Hudson Link for Higher Education in Prison alum. Um, they also do awesome work, um, but they do not have a public health initiative as yet. Um, I'm also a, a grad student at the New School studying Public and Urban Policy, um, and I, as I said, I'm the Executive Director of Canarsie Neighborhood Alliance, and I'm also the author of a working paper called Keeping Black Markets Black, a stratification economic public health and reparative justice model for cannabis equity in the city of New York. Um, so yeah. So I think, I think the main question that a lot of people in this room have is, is what is social equity and social justice? Cool. So me personally, when talking about cannabis, when talking about weed, when talking about ganja, when talking about marijuana, I refrain from using social justice because social justice, it rocks the baby to sleep. The baby can't sleep when you talk about economic justice and intergenerational wealth. So me, again, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna use social justice. I'm gonna use economic justice because this right here, this is a green rush. Correct or incorrect? Thank you. This right here is a green rush. So I'm gonna put aside the social justice, but thank you for using that term. And we're gonna talk about economic justice. Um, and it's, it's straight up, plain and simple. My, so when I say keeping black markets black, what, is that, what does that mean to you? Representation over diversity, thank you. Yeah, so, that, so, that's, so when I say keeping black markets black, that's exactly what I mean. Now, in this new, in this new green rush, uh, many persons have been jumping on board, um, rightfully so, because this is a, this is, Capitalist nation, free market, laissez-faire economics, it drives the engine. However, whenever we leave markets to themselves, whenever we have unfettered markets, they will remain racist and they will remain bigoted. So stratification economic is a corrective policy to this laissez-faire cannabis market. Um, so cannabis equity, they have it in the state, at the state level, fully in Massachusetts, they have it at the, at the municipal level in, in uh, some kind of California municipalities like uh, Cisco, Sacktown, Oakland, and what have you. What I'm concerned with, what, what I go to sleep every night thinking about, and what I'm doing this working paper on, is making sure that when the MRTA passes next session, that cannabis equity in the city of New York, and I'm using the city of New York for a reason as opposed to New York City, in case anybody tries to play around. Um, I hope some of you attorneys got that joke. Um, so, specifically for the city of New York, that when it comes to the city of New York, the groundwork and the framework for equity is already there. I trust I answered everybody's question. Or your question, Josh, sorry, as, as pertaining to social justice. Completely. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't need to talk about restorative justice. Just, we, 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 it's, a, it's a whole, we, we'll, we'll talk. We'll, yeah, we'll talk. Um, let's do one uh, audience question um, before we kick it to Jumani. Um, in the back. How you doing? Question was, where do you see the most opportunity for the black and brown community? Uh, and your name, sir? Hugh? Yeah. Great question, Hugh. So, proposing the murder it's MRTA, but it sounds like murder, so I'm just gonna shorthand it. So, not murder, not so, murder, murder. So, uh -huh. Jeff, what's going on? That's a, we went to school together at Brooklyn College. Um, so, proposed in the murder is, uh, so th there, there, there are nine different types of licenses. You mentioned, I, I believe, five. So, currently in the, well, I'm, let me answer your question just straight on, because I could be a little long-winded. You said, where do I see the most opportunity? So the opportunity is, it's not limited. So I'm not gonna, I refuse to answer your question how it was asked. The opportunity is there throughout from each, each market because prior to legalization, the business model has and is, is still being operated outside of licit markets through growth, cannabis extraction, CBD extraction, home deliveries, home grow, sale, like 
we've been doing this. So in order to correct that, those policies, it would ha we would have to have a complete, I'm not gonna say a complete market share because someone might take that out of context, but to answer your question, in every facet of the supply chain. Cool. So uh, I want to give a big round of applause uh, to Floyd for coming up, uh, sharing his story. Are you going to be around at the after party? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And if you guys have any questions, I'll be around. I did leave all my business cards home. I don't know why, but uh, I'll, I'll be around to answer. Give him questions. your business card. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and before we bring Jermani up, I just want to give a round of applause for uh, everyone in this room. Um, as, uh, as Floyd alluded to, uh, most of the folks here uh, are looking for economic opportunities. Um, but the economic opportunities associated with legalization um, can't ignore equity and justice. Um, it just can't. Um, and it's not really a popular conversation when you're talking about the capitalist world that he was alluding to, um, because it's not quote unquote necessary, um, and many companies don't necessarily care. Um, and it's sad, but all the people in this room, you're out here, you care, um, and I appreciate that, and I hope you all appreciate each other, uh, and I hope that we can do as much as we can for this important facet and issue uh, and cause uh, going forward. So round of applause for all of you. Thank you. Many of you are also here because we have none other than Jumani Williams, New York City public advocate. Thank you so much for coming up. What's up, everybody? How you doing? Everyone excited? I'm excited. My mom came to see you. Oh, where's mom? There's my mom. Hey, mom. Yeah. She was like, she was like, did you know Jumani is speaking? And I'm like, yes, mom. Yes, I, I do know that he is speaking. She's like, I'm coming. Um, so I guess um, you know you, you sort of need no no introduction, um, but but we'll do it anyway. Um, I guess just just very quickly, um, you know, on a personal note, around this time last year, um, I was struggling with with some health challenges. Um, I thought I was developing epilepsy, um, and I um, basically had uh, what was quote unquote fortunately uh, my clonus. So I basically had 50 to 100 different um, episodes in a given day. Um, and I just want to commend you on, on your strength and appreciate you coming out here and all the work that you do um, for those people um, that, that are struggling with that, because I, I know that I was. Um, and you know your strength and everything that you've accomplished and everything that you're going to accomplish, um, I, it really means a lot. Um, and, and thank you for that. So. Um, on, on a brighter note, so, Jumani, who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Jumani Williams. Uh, as of March 14th, I'm the public advocate of the city of New York. Uh, I've been, I was a council member before that for about 10 years. And I've been uh, kind of working on these issues long before. It, it seems pretty popular now, but 10 years ago I was just crazy Jumani. Uh, <laughs> but now it seems like everybody's... Uh, catching up. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to just dive into questions. Shout out to Floyd uh, for, for his work and um, presenting himself and, and telling us what he's, what he's all about. Sounds great. So, like, why cannabis? Why is cannabis so important to you as an issue? Uh, well, it is part of a larger issue. I understand, um, you know, where it's coming from. I, I do still see there's a social justice issue and, of course, an economic justice issue. Um, so, whenever there's inequity or inequality, I try to jump right in. And as much as possible as a council member now as public advocate and uh, marijuana and weed is, is, is another one of those things and it's just frustrating to see and it's very clear when it comes to policies that communities are treated differently I mean even forget marijuana I see the opioid crisis and I see police walking around with the antidote 
like the antidote is that's amazing. And so they're treating folks like they have uh, uh, addictions that they need assistance with. But if you go back to communities uh, that are black and brown, when they had the same issues, they, they didn't get the antidotes. It's probably people still in jail for, for the same issues. And so that's that's very real. And um, you, all the statistics show that um, uh, the, the white community uses marijuana at the same rate, if not a higher rate. Um, but 80, 90 percent of the people who are arrested are black and brown. And it, it just makes no sense. And we now have, I use the words underground market, but we now have a thing that was being sold in the underground market uh, now becoming legal. Uh, and there's specific things that are preventing the very people who are making a living off it from not being so. That makes no sense. And so even medical marijuana right now, which is legal, um, Savino and those that passed it, there's a, something in this is if you have a criminal history, you can't sell it. And that just doesn't make any sense. I'm going to take my jacket off because I'm hot. So I... If you take your jacket off, I guess I can take my jacket off. Because <laughs> I was expecting... I was, expect, I was expecting that you would wear a jacket, and so I was like, oh, I guess I have to wear a jacket. <laughs> I guess you don't know me that well, huh? Well, I mean, I, you, were, you were pretty dressed down at the cannabis parade, so I was, but I figured just in case I'd, I'd wear one. And then you came in with one, and then I was yeah. like, yeah. we got the cannabis parade right here. Thank you, cannabis parade. Thank you. Um, so I, I think, Floyd, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you were saying that there's no social justice issue. You were just focusing the conversation on, on the economics, yeah. Makes sense because of the audience, which which makes sense. But but I th one thing I, I think you know that resonated with me, and I was actually going to go back to the cannabis parade. Is at the cannabis parade, you were talking about expungements, and expungements for many people in this room, you know, it's like oh yeah, we should expunge, we should expunge. But there's no vehicle, or there wasn't. There, there's no vehicle when you were at the cannabis parade for expungements in New York State. But you were on stage and you were like expungements. Why why were you why why why? So I know a lot of work was done on the state, and we didn't quite get there. But I honestly would have preferred not to get there and get it right than to get there and we haven't had expungements. And we don't have vehicles for black and brown people uh, to be able to make money off this. Otherwise, it's not really helpful. Seattle went back 30 years uh, to expungement. Shout out to them. Um, New York State claims to be progressive. This governor claims to be progressive. Whatever. Oh, yeah. That's right, he is progressive. There's nobody, uh, what did he say, what did they say? Uh, they, 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 all the, they all the resistance, I think was the word that he used. Um, I just remember he said, I'm the most progressive governor that New York has ever had. Yeah, whatever. Um, but <laughs> the issue, it's frustrating that these conversations about expungement, about making sure that if we legalize this, that there is a vehicle, as was mentioned, just opening it up is not helpful to the people who are actually feeding their families who have been ravaged by the criminal justice system for the thing that you are now legalizing, that everybody's recognizing should be legal. That's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to just go legalize it so that uh, communities that generally benefit from this can now benefit again without addressing the needs of the communities who've been ravaged by this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's, I sort of agree that if, if we don't do it right, if there's, we're not really adding value to society, we're actually just probably making it worse. Um, so hopefully in 2020, um, we'll, we'll come around. What, what are your thoughts in terms of what happened in Albany? And, and I know your focus is, is the city, but um, do you have any particular thoughts in terms of what happened with the MRTA uh, and the, the decrim piecemeal bill um, and thoughts to 2020 in Albany? Yeah, I mean, the governor did, didn't want to do any of this stuff, whether it was rents or whatever, he just didn't want to do it. He was forced to do it. And I don't think he was forced hard enough on, on this one. Um, I think we could have gotten there. You just have to put the time in. Uh, I think the momentum is there. And so 2021 hopefully will be a better year for uh, marijuana legalization and expungements and access than it was this year. But we have to, we have to keep the pressure. And you, you, you cannot turn your eyes away from this governor. Like he, he, he doesn't have the foil of the Republicans. He doesn't have the foil of the IDC. But he'll create a foil, and so you just, you just got to be very careful. And by the way, we elected a whole bunch of good folks to the Senate, and so we give them a shout out. But we can't walk away from them either. We walked away from Obama, we see what happened. And so once we get folks elected, stay with them. 
don't just walk away. And so we have to continue to be able to prop up those folks uh, because the, the forces, are, it's, not, it's not easy in legislature. It's not easy in politics. You get in and, and the world is different and, and the governor is, is, a, is a slick dude. So um, you want to make sure we keep supporting the folks that we put in there. You say, do you say 2020 or 2021? I said 2020. I'm, I'm 2020? hoping next year. Maybe I said 2021, but I'm hoping uh, next year. I'm just making sure because some people have said that 2020 might not happen because it's an election year, and so. It's I think we should just continue pushing. There's no reason why we shouldn't. This, Couldn't this agree has more. to happen. I mean, there are people still suffering. We've tried our best. Decrim doesn't work. If decrim worked, it, then we wouldn't have this problem anymore. They decrim in the 70s. They decrim and keep decrim. It doesn't just legalize it. And I'm, I'm thankful. In the city, we're trying to act with the state. Does not. We, we passed the bill, happened to be my bill, so you can no longer test uh, THC uh, for employment, which I think is, is huge. Um, they kept some exceptions for um, police and others, which I think is, is, is dumb also. Just take it away. Treat it like alcohol. And if you're not tested for alcohol, I don't know why you're testing for marijuana. That doesn't mean you should go to work high. You should probably be fired if you go to work high. Um, you should be fired if you go to work drunk. I mean, just, this, this, it's just the same things. But we want to take away the barriers. <laughs> that have been preventing people from getting this. There have been black women who've lost their children because of marijuana. That makes no sense, absolutely no sense. And so these barriers have just been excuses for bigoted policies, and we gotta keep taking them down. Is there anything that you sort of see from uh, a social equity standpoint, lessons for entrepreneurs, when it does become legal, what you or me or the city can be doing or what the people in this room should be doing to foster that entrepreneurial ecosystem? Yeah, like what was being said, the market left to its own forces is not going to work. I mean, I was, walking a I was watching a documentary where the people who were in the industry were, looked more like you, like me. And in the documentary, they said one of the differences, the people on the streets were weed heads. This is business. Like making it seem like they would not be able to do this. And so... It's great to talk about, it, but if we don't put a system in place, it's not going to work. Also, the thing about privilege is what you are individually going to give up yourself. And so is, is everybody going to say, let's make this equitable? Or everybody's going to say, yeah, we should do that, but let me get mine here. And so it's really important to focus on that. This is something that we have to focus on and make sure there's a pipeline. Go into those communities and say, this is how you can begin to grow. This is how you can begin to sell. This is the pathway. You have to spell it out. This is the pathway to get this done. By the way, here's some capital uh, that might be needed to get it started. If we don't put those things in place, and it's not going to happen, then we're just all talking. I agree. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Sorry about this microphone. I'm not sure what that is. Um, questions for Jamani? Right here. question was from uh, AM New York. Uh, pursuant to the failure uh, this year in Albany, uh, do you have a thought process in terms of strategy for, for next year now that you're a public advocate? We have, um, the strategy is similar. That hopefully the emphasis will be different. So we do have the bill that I passed in the city council. We do have a, another bill to try to prevent, it's a rezo, so it's not as effective law like the other one, but to prevent THC from being a cause of being kicked out of public housing. Um, but I was almost solely focused on housing. And we got some of the most, this is the best tenants' rights uh, package that we've seen in our lifetime. And so we got that done. There's still some more done. There's still some more to do. But perhaps some of us that were working on those issues uh, can now focus on issues like uh, legalization and making sure that legalization happens right, uh, correctly. And hopefully we can continue to generate enough emphasis on the ground to force them to do this. because. Elected officials don't just do things sometimes, particularly people like Cuomo. Um, and I just need to be clear, a lot of the issues that we're working with that are problematic came before Donald Trump, and they're not just Republicans. And so the problems we have across this country are Democratic governors, Democratic mayors, Democratic council members, and I'm a Democrat, and we have to be honest about that. If it wasn't for the foolishness they did, Trump wouldn't be here. And so we have to hold everybody accountable for this and not just Republicans.
So you mentioned um, you mentioned Cuomo, um, but in, in terms of holding people accountable, in terms of holding um, some of the electeds, you know, to task after they're elected, um, you mentioned that we elected some new state senators. Um, you know, it, it seems like yes, there could have been more that Cuomo could have and, and probably should have done um, in terms of the budget and also leaning in on on some of them. But I guess what would be your message um, to the the Long Island Six? Uh, about cannabis and uh, what would be your message to us as we, this community and people more broadly who are passionate about this issue, how can we encourage them and other state senators who are not uh, past, the, past the finish line on, on this issue? You know, I, I do want to shout out uh, Angie Stewart Cousins. She did a bang up job on a whole bunch of issues. Um, so she should get a shout out. Uh, and some of hasty. So, so uh, Floyd was referencing a Gothamist article um, that erroneously stated that nine senators state specifically uh, were against the bill. Um, the Gothamist article was mostly correct, um, but as they can attest, I very uh, bluntly uh, disagreed with certain people that were included on that article, um, as well as people who were not included on that article and should have been very much included in that article. Um, I'm not sure if it helps to name names, especially with a lot of media in the room, um, because I'm hopeful to build a more cooperative approach. Um, in particularly, so, so yes, you're 100% right, it wasn't just the Long Island Six. It was six plus three, maybe four. Um, I think that some of the people included were not accurate, and. Um, one, maybe two people who were not included should have been on the list. Um, but it's not just a question of Long Island Six. Um, in terms of Prasad specifically, um, I like to, th and this is sort of, it's actually interesting you're asking me because I would sort of, I'm gonna now turn this to Jamani, um, because I spoke with Prasad, uh, Senator Prasad I should say, um, on the, I wanna say the Tuesday of, uh, the last Tuesday of session. And I was like, Senator Prasad, my name is Josh Weinstein, I run this thing called Canagather, it's pretty cool, you should come sometime. Um, what are your thoughts on the MRTA? I obviously knew what her thoughts on the MRTA was. Um, and she said, yesterday, I had 73 phone calls into my office in favor of cannabis. Um, and we had, a, we had a bit of a discussion about, you know, some of her uh, sensible concerns and, and whatnot. Um, about, about the MRTA, um, but 73 was a lot. So I would think that constituents calling in and saying, hey, we really care about this issue would, would be a lot. Um, but also to, to piggyback on the next point that you were making, which is that a real problem that cannabis prohibition is sort of wreaking on these communities is that you're throwing a bunch of black and brown people in jail. Young men, young women, young people in general, old people, everyone, you're just throwing people in jail and destroying the fabric of these communities. Um, and you're saying that prohibition is important because we need to maintain the integrity of these communities. So how do you, on the one hand, speak with either a Long Island Six or a Senator Prasad or one of the other two or three senators who are quote unquote holding out on this issue and say, hey, your constituents care and turn that into a yes. And then also on the flip side, how do you say, hey, your community is being destroyed and ravaged by this racist war on drugs? And how do you show that and say, get rid of this, and that's what helps it, not keep the status quo? So those two points, I think, are your sort of question, and I have the same question, and so now uh, I, I turn that to you. Um, so obviously, I, I, was not, I wish you had voted a, a different way. Um, I wish all of them had. Um, that doesn't take away any other good work um, that she's done. I think the first thing we always have to remember is that the black community is now monolithic, and we have a tendency to think that they are. And some uh, of the black community, particularly Caribbean, are a lot more conservative than people people think it is. I mean, they think it's only certain places, and um, it's it's a lot more conservative on a lot of issues. And this is one. And we do have to continue working on all of those centers, particularly. You know, I think the senator, that's one area where a vote to legalize won't, is not the same as it would be in Long Island. Like that, that's a, a vote that I don't think will 
will be as harmful. But growing up, many of us, these beliefs, some of us have just accepted about marijuana, about what it means. Like when you see, like what it means when you see a, a young man smoking marijuana on the streets, what you are ingrained to think about that person and why that person is doing it. And so those things are still in some of the community's mindset and thinking that we just are now saying that everyone should be walking down the street smoking marijuana, getting high. And that's just not what that is at all. Obviously, you can't drink in public, you shouldn't smoke in public is, 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 is my point of view as well. And so we have to, we should just still go with those sensitivities, um, but continue to dispel the myth of what the reason is why they're not voting for it, because a lot of it is myth, and it, it just takes some time. So as you mentioned, I do want to still continue to try to be collaborative, but we do have to put pressure on everyone, and that pressure can come in form of meetings, can come in the form of, of phone calls, whatever pressure we have to apply, but it should also continue to come in providing information that debunks the myth with the sensitivities of how this person may have grown up in the community they've grown up and what that does to the mindset that unfortunately they've, they've received and accepted the, the negativity that I don't think is, is a fair assessment in comparison to alcohol. How do you prevent uh, someone with his face uh, from dominating the distribution and the, the economics? The, the best, I, you know, as a public guy, I have, um, um, I have certain things I can do, certain things I can't. But what I can continue to do is raise the issue of what we need to do and, and why, and continue to put the pressure on the people who are voting for this. Like, do not vote on it unless we've just figured out an expungement or figured out a pathway so that exactly what you're saying, the people who were selling this, I use the word, I prefer the word underground market, who were selling this on the underground market uh, now have the same access. Because if they don't have the access, they are going to find a way to continue to feed their families. And it just doesn't make any sense. And it is based on race and it is a bigoted policy. And so that's, that's what I'm going to continue to do. And I'm going to keep continue to call people out uh, as they're allowing us to continue. But the question I, I want to also say is, what are you and others that look like you are going to do to make sure uh, that the markets are open to people who have been historically disenfranchised? So it has to be a, a partnership, and it can't be just on, on folks like me. It's got to be the folks. I always say the more privilege you have, the more you have to be in and the more risk you have to take. So the question is, what are we going to do, and what are you going to do to make sure that happens? So as a pillar from Jaime Madre, um, do a lot of great work. Uh, educating folks, and I guess, uh, yeah, I think she brought up a good point, um, which is actually why um, I got so passionate about being involved in Albany this year, is because I went up to Albany and everyone was like, no one's talked to me. And I'm like, what? I mean, I was speaking on the Republican side, so there's some political reasons, but, you know, it, it seems like there's a big education gap um, in terms of electeds, but also, as you were alluding to, in terms of uh, people in general. Um, and so I guess a question from that, um, especially for me, is like, how do you think we should go about educating people about cannabis, dispelling some of those myths? Well, so the booths outside, are they people who are in the industry on, the, on the, that's selling? I didn't see folks that look like me. You said s selling, no, just yeah. different. So uh, one is, is an RO, so Vireo. Um, you have uh, two law firms, two accounting firms, uh, one uh, media uh, campaign purchaser slash a for purpose apparel salesperson. Um, I was yeah. just saying, and I appreciate everything that's being done, but we should get some folks in front that also look like the people that we're trying to educate and bring in so they can see some faces that look like themselves. Um, that's just done all the time, so it's not a, a, a slight here, but like if we're going to do it, we have to do it intentionally, because, and it's hard work to reach out to get those folks, but we have to do it so when people walk in and they go into these booths, they're like, ah, I can do this, I can relate, I can see. Um, so I think that's, that's one, that's important. And two, we have to set up a mechanism to do it, so that's why I really do want to reach out, because maybe my office, we can find a way, and, 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 and folks like Floyd, we can find a way to educate those communities and show them the pipeline uh, of how to get it done. So I don't have all the answers. I know that I do want to see it get it done. And if 
if people don't even talk about it, like if they're trying to just legalize this thing without getting that mechanism in place, then, then we have a problem. I, I completely agree, and if you want to help, or if Pilar wants to help in terms of diversifying uh, our sponsorship base, um, I am all in favor of getting Canada Gather more sponsors. <laughs> um, one, well, not, I mean, I, I mean, not just sponsors. Maybe it's just a booth, it's a couple of booths that are dedicated to even maybe they, maybe they didn't sponsor, but just be here and be present. I, I don't disagree. Um, don't disagree. Um, I guess one last question from Noah. I was saying that in, I remember an, a report issued by um, one of your predecessors decades ago, I think, in a study of the prices of nutritious food in different neighborhoods and found that the prices in central Harlem were higher than in other neighborhoods. I think it was the poor pay more for less. Uh, and I note that um, there were listening sessions. The, uh, the state organized... Uh, uh, governor's office organized listening sessions around the state to hear comments of the public about legalization. And um, my perception has been for years that the city electeds have never collaborated to uh, conduct those conversations. There have never been open sessions or educational sessions, which I, I've advocated to numerous electeds for, for quite a while. So the, the question is whether it's possible for the Public Advocate's Office as a citywide elected office to uh, go beyond what the other electeds have done, such as the Comptroller in issuing his reports and the Manhattan DA in issuing his reports and the Mayor in terms of the report that came out in December of 2018, uh, to reach out to the public, to the general public, for, uh, to have a, a city office as opposed to the private sessions um, and industry sessions and educational forums conducted by advocates. We should talk, if there's folks that can help build that out, I'm happy for my office to be a sponsor, to provide some assistance, legitimacy of, of holding that, and my, the public advocates office can hold hearings. Some people who support it and voted yes that are happy that it didn't happen, because we still have this fear of, I can't legalize it because fill in the blank. And we just have to acknowledge that as well. It's just a fear thing. Um, and you know, I don't know why. Fear of what? A fear of legalizing a drug and what's going to happen. And I, I, I mean, I always ask folks, does anybody know who smokes marijuana? Anybody raise their hand? Does anybody know who, someone who said, I was going to smoke it, but it's illegal, so I'm not? Nobody raises their hand. And so for me, it's, it's, just, it's just frustrating. Like, the fear of what you think could happen with legalization is scarier to you than the black and brown bodies that are in jail and have now can't get a student loan and now uh, can't get housing. Like that just doesn't make sense. And I opened up about, you know, my short time uh, selling marijuana uh, recently just to try to demonk the bill. Wait, wait, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so it was something between six months and two years. I can't really remember. It was in high school. It was like a nickel bag, dime bag of weed. Um, but if I had gotten caught with that, the trajectory of my life might have been much different. Um, and it, it didn't seem like a big thing back then. You were in high school, you just, I wanted to buy some extra comic books. Like it wasn't, I wasn't like making a huge living and surviving off it, but it was something um, that I did and I, I became very public about it because, you know, it, it, it's just, there's a perception of what it is and, and, and who sells it and why, usually in the black and brown community because you know, a lot of white folks sell weed also, but they don't, for some, for some reason, have that um, stigma. By the way, I stopped, the reason I stopped selling it because somebody wouldn't pay for a bag. And then, it was like, you could tell your supplier to come and talk to me. I'm like, I don't want no parts of that. This is not what I'm in for. So that was kind of the end of my, of my career at that moment in time. But, uh, but um, it's just, it's just, it's just the, none of the reasons I've heard make any sense. And when I ask folks, what about alcohol, they really don't really have uh, a response. So I want to thank you, Josh, and for everything you're doing and for, uh, for your organization. Just creating this space to have the discussion, uh, I think it's critically important. And thanks for having me. Round of applause for the one and only Jumani Williams. Thank you.